What's up guys, Jason of New Year's Revolution down here in the cave with a uh, in nice introduction to a very surreal uh, moment here on the channel. Many of you watched the Magnum TA interview, which was like uh, pretty insane to, to be, you know, chatting with Magnum TA, you know, a guy that I watched as a kid. Um, many of you listened to the uh, Steve Rosenthal interview. A guy that was responsible for our childhood action figures, the AWA Remco figures. And now you are going to watch as I had another chance to interview another wrestling mega icon. Uh, this time from an organization that, you know, maybe a lot of us, at least in my area, weren't, uh, didn't have as much exposure to until later, the AWA. Uh, we get a chance to uh, talk to, I get a chance to talk to Greg Gagne. Uh, so this is all thanks to my man TC over at the uh, Facebook, uh, the Remco Facebook page that I used to be a part of. Um, I, just, just because people like the channel, uh, you know, TK, did I say TC earlier? Not TC, TK, um, just reached out and said, hey, you want to, you want to interview this guy Rosenthal from AWA? And I was like, Okay. Thanks, that's insane. And then from there, Steve Rosenthal uh, hooked me up with Greg Gagne and Magnum TA. So surreal, surreal stuff that I never expected to happen. Uh, you meet people at signings and conventions and things like that. You might get a 20-second uh, interview with them. You know, hey, can you? What was your favorite match of your career? But these are one-hour long, 45-minute long interviews. So, anyway, sit back, relax, enjoy uh, the New Age Revolution talking to Greg Gagne. Ladies and gentlemen, Jason up here, New Age Revolution, and as you can see, you've already stopped looking at my face. You've shifted over to another very familiar face sitting right next to me. Guys, we are live with uh, AWA icon, pioneer, co-creator, wow. whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, refuse to say, I refuse to say superstar because we're not talking about that organization. Uh, AWA professional wrestler Greg Gagne. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. How are you, sir? I'm good, and thank you for having me on. I suppose nobody out there would recognize this old face. It's been quite a while since I've been on the wrestling scene. No, we've, uh, trust me, uh, you, your images are burned in our brains from childhood. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to ask you, uh, has David Schultz found a real woman yet? I don't think so. He's been looking out in San Francisco and not having a lot of luck. All he wants is a real woman. A real woman. We all do. <laughs> Guys, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look it up. Uh, look up maybe uh, Dr. D. David Schultz, AWA interview blooper. It's, uh, it's one of the most hilarious things you'll ever see. And for me, part of what makes that clip so special is Mean Gene's reaction. Uh, he, lost <laughs> he lost it, but he loses it in such a subtle way that he's so professional. He, he laughs into his shoulder. And, and at one point, you know, Dr. D said, as the camera is now fo uh, panning off of Gene and, and only focusing on David, uh, David turns to Gene and says, what's wrong with you? You know, it, it's just absolutely perfect. Yeah. Gene was tent bent over laughing so hard. It was a great uh, classic interview. But, you know, they were so different back then than, than what they do now. Um, I worked with the WWE for a while. And uh, they had me, uh, one day I'm sitting with Vince McMahon and we're watching Shawn Michaels have a match. And he turned to me and says, why can't my guys wrestle like that? I said, well, I guess they're not being trained properly. <laughs> well, you think you can do it? I said, yeah, I think I can do it. I've done it before. So I was, I was sent down to Louisville and to Atlanta. And when I got down there, we all said to do a TV show. And they said, you have to write out their interview. And I said, oh, God, you know, that isn't the way you do it. But that's what they wanted. So I wasn't doing it that way and ended up getting fired. But uh, I was with CM Punk. And I usually would just give them their beginning and an ending for him. And then they'd fill in. And he was pouting around that he, you know, not getting called up and all that. They're telling me I'm never going to make it. I'm not going to make it. And I said, so you're a little pissed off. He said, yeah, I am. I said, give me the interview. How you really feel about uh, the WWE and Vince McMahon? And he went. <laughs> I said, let it go. About three months later, he was called up. 
Well, and he, I think I think you might have ignited something in him because he's uh, you know he yes. was famous during that time for those kinds of interviews. Uh, That's you know, one of the interviews. I mean, what you saw from the guys, you know, the ones that were really good. That was the real personality coming out. And whenever when Vern trained us or when I trained people, I learned from him. You, we all have an inner self that we want to project, but we're a little inhibited and we don't do it. Sure. I used to take a couple of guys, I'd have a few, give me a few drinks and then the real them came out and I said, this is really you. That's who you have to be because the, the, the public is only going to get into you if they believe you and they're not going to believe you for trying to be somebody you're not. Right. The interview, the, 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 the wrestler putting the message out there is important, but I think just as important is the guy that's holding the mic. And so we go back to talk about Mean Gene Okerlund. How special was Mean Gene? You had him before the WWF had him. How special was this guy? Well, Gene was actually, uh, he worked at w, uh, WTCN, which was Channel 11 uh, in Minneapolis, an NBC station, or uh, I think it was NBC. And they did our, our TV. And our announcer was Marty O'Neill. Marty was, to me, the best of all time. Okay. He, he, just, he was a... He was small. He was a former, uh, he played minor league baseball. He was, he was a, a radio guy, um, just a great guy. And he did all our interviews all the time and some of the play by play. And one day he got, he got sick. He, he had the eye infection and couldn't go on TV. Um, and we were doing our interviews for all our cities on Monday, all our major cities. We did, we taped on Monday, our interviews. And they would go from nine in the morning till probably seven, eight at night to get all the markets in. And uh, Marty couldn't make it. He, he said, I'm not going to be able to make it. So uh, this was on a Thursday night. He called us and said, I'm not going to be able to make TV Saturday, our live show, or Monday. I can't get in front of the cameras. It'll hurt my eyes too much. So Al Darusha, he said, well, I've got a guy I work with. Uh, Al at one time was a salesman for the, for the channel and for channel 11. And so was Gene. He was a salesman selling advertising. He said, but he used to have a, he used to have radio in South Dakota and he's got a great voice. So Al took him up to his, to uh, Gene's cabin on Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. And he took tapes with him of Marty O'Neill and doing the interviews. Yeah. And Monday Gene walked in. Boom. It was magic. It was unbelievable. He picked up, he watched all Marty. He had Gene at his own style, but he, the delivery that Marty had and Gene picked up on that and then did his own thing. And he was, you know, he was phenomenal. Uh, I, you know, to, to, to learn that he was a salesman before he got into wrestling um, that, that goes hand in hand. What I, what I think he was trying to, that, that, that image that he was trying to portray on camera uh, kind of reminds me of a used car salesman. Yeah. Well, that was Gene. That was really Gene that you got. And he did a fabulous job. Speaking of brilliant people, because I really feel like Mean Gene is a very special person. Another guy that you got your hands on first and exposed him to the world first was Bobby Heenan. And to me, again, Bobby Heenan was perfect. Uh, he, he was sneaky. He was a con man. His own guys couldn't trust him. Whenever there was a turn, it was because Bobby was stealing their money. Um, how imp well, how great was Bobby Heenan, and how important was the manager in the eighties? Well, Bobby was a unique individual. He was his personality. He started wrestling for Dick the Bruiser. Actually, he was he was taking the ring jackets from the ring. Okay, and and eventually they used him as a manager because he. He just picked up, he could talk. He, what you saw with Bobby Heenan is the way he always was. Yeah. He was the most um, oh, prolific yeah. manager of all times. But not only manager, he was also phenomenal in the ring. He was, there was nobody, no manager that could duplicate what he did outside the ring and inside the ring. Uh, he, was, he was a smart ass. In public, he was a smart ass on TV. It wasn't any different. And he, I mean, there's so many Bobby Heenan stories of the pranks he used to pull on people and get guys fighting one another. 
just stir him up, tell this guy, hey, this guy's talking to me, he's doing this. <laughs> then he'd tell this guy over there, and pretty soon these guys are having it out, and he's over there laughing his ass off. He was, uh, he was, he was brilliant. Yeah. And um, Bachwinkle and Stevens, uh, it, it, Bobby worked for the Bruiser, and he worked in Chicago once in a while. And then uh, he wanted to get out of there and came up to the AWA, and they matched him up with Nick Bachwinkle and Ray Stevens. And that thing clicked like that. Yeah. Bachwinkle and Stevens were phenomenal in the ring, pretty good talkers, and Bobby was just what they needed. And they actually, they were the longest running ever AWA tag team champions, three years. And it was, and they were just, I mean, they sold out everywhere they went. I think, I think everybody gives credit to Bobby Heenan for being, you know, a manager and his, and his mic skills, but in the ring, again, very underrated. Um, the, the, his ability to, you know, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk too, too insider terms, but to sell, you know, the fact, you know, him flipping over the ropes and just the way he would sell a punch from a guy, even as a manager taking a punch on the outside of the ring, you could blast him and he'd go flying over the ropes or flying over the corner turnbuckles. He was fantastic. He gave, he gave the people inside and outside the ring, what they wanted. He was that, the guy everybody wanted to knock the crap out of. Yeah. And when he got in the ring, he got the crap knocked out of him. And uh, it just, it was magic. He was, he was sensational. I mean, when you put him, as, I would put him as the top, uh, the number one uh, manager of all time. Yeah. And probably in the top five in ring performers. Yeah, I would agree 100%. Uh, top five wrestling personalities, period, of all time. Yeah. Um, my early memory. So I, I lived in New York. And so, like I said earlier, oh, you know, fortunate for you. Exactly. And still here. And so, you know, we had, we had the WWF. Um, That's why it was unfortunate for you. I didn't mean New York was bad. It's, you know, it's just two different styles and I'm sorry to interrupt you. Absolutely. Two different styles. No, no. And, but what, what I was saying is that's, that's, that was the thing that drew me in early being eight years old. Of course, I'm attracted to the superhero and Hulk Hogan and junkyard dog. And, you know, the whole production of the WWF, but as, as I, as 85 turned and turned, and then I, that's when I started watching the AWA on ESPN, but mm -hmm. you were coming from the showboat. Uh, when did you start taping at the showboat? Where were you prior to the showboat? Oh, we were doing it in the uh, Channel 11 studio. Okay, so you were studio wrestling. We were studio wrestling, yeah. And that thing was, I mean, it, it worked. It worked. And we moved into the showboat uh, for ESPN. And, you know, we, we, it wasn't, we weren't doing the regular, we were doing our, still our syndicated program. The ESPN show was totally different. So we did it, we did it in the casino out there in, in Vegas and had a great run with it. I mean, it was, it was doing numbers. The only problem was we were losing our talent as fast as we'd put it on. Big man was stealing it. And pretty soon, you know, you didn't, you, you didn't have the top notch people that you, uh, you had in the past that really would have caught about, catapulted that thing to who knows where. I would have thought, and this is just layman's thinking. Um, I would have thought that back then there would have been a little bit more loyalty to where you came from or, or where you were currently, you know, uh, working and building and building this thing. And, you know, now we're on ESPN and we're doing huge things. Why did you lose so many people to Vince? Well, we didn't have them under contract. I mean, okay. in professional wrestling from day one, it was a handshake and everybody lived up to their handshake. Their word was good. He's a friend of mine, and I hate to bury him, but Hulk Hogan was the first one to break that contract. Right. Break the, break handshake. the handshake deal with Vern. Right. And um, we, had, we had done a show out in Phoenix, Arizona, our last battle royal with the winners to meet the champion and Andre the Giant. And then from that time on, Hogan was leaving for Japan for a stint over there and coming back. Christmas week was our big week. That was always sold out in all our major cities that we ran. And so Hogan cut all the interviews before he left. We get there Christmas night. Hogan doesn't show up. So 
couldn't find him, couldn't find him. My dad got a, a letter on November t- or on December 21st that said, hey, uh, I'm not coming back. Signed the Hulk. December 21st, 1983, we're talking. 1983. Okay. And Vern looked at it and he's a Tampa, Florida. Him and Eddie Graham were always pulling jokes on each other. So he thought it was a joke. Okay. And then hope that Hulk didn't show up that night. So we went on without him. Place was sold out. And I called him the next day. I said, Hulk, where are you? What's going on? Why, when I went to Japan, McMahon was on the plane with Andre and I and signed me to a contract. And I said, well, you know, this isn't the way you do business. I mean, fulfill your agreement with us. Make those Christmas, make this Christmas week and then go. But you get to you fulfill your commitments. You don't just walk out on people like that. And he said, well, Vince is paying me more to stay home. So the rest was history. You got to think that that world title run had to have been a part of that airplane conversation because it happened a month later. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it was. Hogan was always, you know, hoping to be a champion. Um, We actually had a deal and nobody else knows this because we had to sign an NDA. Um, We had, um, before Hogan left, it was about end of August, CBS came to us, network. And they wanted to do a two hour show in April of 84 with Hogan versus Bachwinkle. Oh, wow. And hopefully that night Hogan might win the title. And we were, we, we signed the NDA. We couldn't say anything about it. They didn't want anybody to get wind of it. So when he left in 83, it blew the whole thing when he left uh, in January. A two hour network show in 1984, first of its kind. Yeah, we've been the first one. So we're losing, guys. We're talking about losing. But also in 85, 86, we get two huge signings coming into the AWA. We get Sergeant Slaughter, who, Mm -hmm. you know, is this, again, real-life superhero connected with G.I. Joe, the whole thing. And then we get Jimmy Snuka. Uh, I can certainly understand Sergeant Slaughter. I can understand both of them. But at the time, Jimmy Snuka... Uh, is is notoriously not reliable, or at least that's what you know the fans have learned growing up. And in fact, he's a couple of years removed from a very serious incident. Uh, mm-hmm. What made you take a chance on Jimmy Snuka? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Uh, actually, going back, Jimmy Snuka and Don Morocco were in Oregon. And Vern had seen him in Hawaii and then they were wrestling for Don and they were finishing up. So Vern brought both Don Morocco and Snooka in with us and they, they both did very well. And Snooka was, we got along really well, Vern and Snooka and myself, and he liked us a lot. So when it, when it, he had his problems up there and he wanted to come in and we're not going to turn him down. Right. He's a great performer in the ring and Sergeant Slaughter, he was trained by Vern. Yeah. Uh, out in the old barn with uh, Buddy Rose and uh, Chris Taylor and Doug Summers and who I forget who else was in that one. But Vern trained 138 wrestlers. And out of that, only two of them didn't make main event. Really? Over their, over their career. Yeah. Where is this old barn? Well, it's it's west in the Twin Cities. It's on a okay. little lake called Lake, lake Riley. But he had a hundred and he had a 140 acres or 180 acres on one side and about 120 on the other side of the highway on the river bluffs of the Minnesota river. And that's where it all happened. That's where it all happened. I mean, he trained Gene and Ole, Gene Ole and Lars Anderson. A lot of people don't know that. Okay. Eddie Starkey, Baron Von Raschke, uh, Dale Lewis. uh, Oh God. Blackjack Mulligan, Blackjack Lanza, uh, you know, and then our crew, we had uh, Ric Flair, Ken Patera, Jim Brunzel, the Iron Sheik, myself, and Bob Bruggers. And Bob was the only one that never really made it. Right. But he was starting a little late in his career. He was um, 31, okay. and he had finished up playing pro football, and he was pretty busted up. So it was really hard on him. You talk about – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. What? Ricky no. Steamboat was trained there. And, I mean, you know, just a slew of great names and great talent. 
and they learned the proper way. You know, Vern made you wrestle. And that was the biggest difference between the New York style and the AWA style and the NWA. NWA, the guys had to wrestle. I know I wrestled in the second matchup at Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. with uh, uh, Johnny Rods. Yep. And we were in the second match. And we wrestled about 12, 15 minutes. I came out of the ring and Vince Senior standing. He says, what was that? I said, well, that was a wrestling match. And we had the people standing. And he said, how are my guys going to follow it? And I said, that's their problem. But it was funny because guys, Vern always sent guys up to New York, you know, Billy Superstar Graham, Ken Patera, you know, and on and on. Um, when they were finishing up with us to get them, get them ready, they'd go up there for about six months and do TV and then, then wrestle Bruno. And the guy, our guys from the AWA that went up always wrestled in the main events. When the New York talent came to the AWA, they never made it past the second or third match on the cards. Yeah. It was different. just such a different style. And yeah. the people were, they, they wanted to see a competitive wrestling match. You know, McMahon wanted big figures, cartoon characters uh, that were merchandise. You know, that's the way he thought. Byrne thought because of his amateur background, he was a high school state champion, Big Ten champion a number of times, NCAA champion, wrestled on the Olympic team. You know, he used to say to us, the marquee up there, it says wrestling. We're giving him wrestling, boys. So you're going to learn how to get in and out of holds how to, and how to protect yourself. And, you know, it was, it was a very physical camp that we did six hours a day, six days a week from October to March. And we were in that barn with no windows and one light bulb over the ring, two stories up and, you know, be 15 below outside and we're in there for six hours pounding away. But when you came out of there, you were prepared. Michael Hayes, I think said, yeah, I think Michael Hayes said it best in an interview. He said, anybody that came out of the Vern Gagne tramp or camp, they were ready to rock and roll like right now. It usually took most guys when they, as a rookie, it took them five to seven years, hopefully, to get to the main event. Most of our guys were in the three year, three years or less. You, you kind of answered my my next question because I, I was gonna no, I was gonna say that Nick Bockwinkel and Ric Flair and even Rick Martel, to me, those are perfect world champions for this particular era. Um, and then, you know, so I was going to ask you, why didn't the AWA promote the superhero champion like a Hulk Hogan? But you just answered that is because this is, you know, this was Vern's background. This is who was training these guys. And we were going to have a wrestling company here, not a, before the phrase even existed, a sports entertainment company. Right. And, you know, Hogan probably would have had a great opportunity if he'd have hung with us and could have been the champion. Who knows? What happens then? I mean, and this is just projecting. And I'm sure you've been asked that question before. If Hogan sticks around, do we have mm -hmm. a completely different landscape today? Yeah, we do. Yeah, I don't think McMahon could have made it work without Hulk to where he was trying to go with it. You know, he needed that one big superstar that made the move. And then he got on the network. And then, you know, everybody in all the territories, they wanted to be on the network TV. So it was hard for everybody to hang on to their talent. Yeah. He hit the AWA the hardest because we were the biggest to hit. We were in from Winnipeg to St. Louis was our TV show all the way to the West coast. And then we had on TSN out of Winnipeg. They'd film our matches up there, tape the matches and they played across Canada. So, I mean, we had a huge territory plus, you know, we only worked about 250 to 270 times out of the year. All these other ones were running every night. Oh you know, double on Saturdays and Sundays. And the guys, you know, half of them are divorced. They're never home with their families. Right. It's very important for Vern for the guys to be able to be with their families. So in the summertime, we had a whole month of May off, first two weeks of June. And then we wrestled maybe 12, 15 tops until the end of September. And then from October 1st to the end of April, phew, we we're red hot. That's when we went hard. And that's when we sold out all the buildings. Uh, up in the Midwest in the summertime. Yeah. People have been locked up in the winter. 
they want to go outside and it's hard to get them back into the arenas at that time. So we just picked the right time to do it. And he gave us the time off, uh, which was great. I was able to coach my kids in football and baseball and yeah, watch my daughter play sports, you know? And when you talk to Ric Flair, I mean, he was on the road 365 days out of the year and had all these doubles on Saturdays and Sundays and wrestling hurt like we all did, but no family life. And it's hard to keep a family together when you're not there. You know what I think what bothers me the most too about uh, the talent raid as it's, you know, come to be known is he wasn't doing anything with a lot of these fellas. Um, if you, mm -hmm. if you look, he, you know, he brings in, you know, he takes Brad Ringens away from me and he puts him in a, he puts him in a, a TV squash. You know, mm -hmm. he takes uh, Mr. Electricity, Steve Regal and does nothing with him. I think Buck Zumhoff came in to, to lose on TV a few times. You know, mm -hmm. to me, to me, that's just, that's just taking names from a company to do nothing with them. Well, he, he's doing something. He's making them look like his talents better than what we had out there, but he grabbed the right Roddy Pipers and, the, and the, you know, the Hogan's and Shawn Michaels. Um, he sent me a tape and Marty Gennetti had sent me one. Shawn was in uh, San Antonio and Gennetti was in the Kansas City area. They sent me these tapes up and I said, you know, here's a good young, we could put these two guys together, train them right, be a heck of a tag team. Hmm. And they came and once they got established, we didn't have the money to sign guys to contracts. Nobody did. I see. And, and uh, you couldn't hold them. So once, once they got established, they're gone. And it was so frustrating because every time you built this talent, getting some momentum, Vince grabbed them. So it was just a matter of time before, you know, finance you just couldn't keep up with it it was tough I, yes it, it was and 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 that's i i kind of I, I watched that as a kid because you got to watch the end of the awa play out on the espn show you know you mm -hmm. saw you saw watered down talent or you saw you saw you know uh i think you guys were trying to connect with other organizations bringing in you know jerry lawler and and jarrett's and uh what was the plan there was the plan to well all the promoters, uh, Bill Watts, uh, Jarrett, uh, Crockett's, Don Owens, everybody got together and they wanted to create something on TV where we combine all this talent, which was good. We did very well at first, yeah. but they all wanted, they all wanted, you know, their guy looking better than this guy. And they just couldn't work it out. And in the meantime, Vince is going in. We had a match coming up in San Francisco. It took us uh, about three months to build the TV ratings up. When you go into a new market and it's a big market to get, get them. We finally had the Cow Palace sold out and we're in a meeting with Watts and all the other promoters. And uh, we get a call from the TV uh, station manager in San Francisco. He says, Vince McMahon is here. And we bartered the time for our, our tapes. So we kept two or two or six or eight minutes for commercial time or interviews, whatever. And then they sold the rest of it. Uh, Vince offered us uh, $2,000 a week for the TV. Yeah. So Vern said, well, we're going to have this big gate would go 2,500. And he comes back. Vince went to 3,000. And we're talking for about a half hour and Vern calls back. All right, I'll do 3,500. And then we never heard back from him. So we thought we had the deal. So this is six weeks before our match and we get out to San Francisco and for six weeks, they had Vince McMahon's tapes in there. So we didn't have tapes in promoting the, the card. Didn't even realize it. He ended up paying him $5,000 a week to get his show on TV. He came right into our station manager in Minneapolis, according to our station manager. Now here's the kind of ratings we had in our, in our network. In Minneapolis, we had a 24 rating yeah. with a 64 share of the audience. Huge. I mean, that's bigger than the Super Bowl. And in most of our markets, those were the kind of numbers we had. And they were the big, the big markets that McMahon needed to expand his television, you know, for selling the advertising. So he hit us hard, plus we had the great talent. We were, we were working with the Crockett's. But they got a match. In, we get a match in Chicago, Comiskey Park. And combine the, the, 
uh, Crockett's group with our group matches were phenomenal. You know, great talent, Magnum TA, Dusty yeah. Rhodes, you know, the crew is there and our crew. And well, in the locker room, David Crockett is walking around trying to sign our talent to contracts. <laughs> <laughs> and we're supposed to be working together. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why it didn't work. I, I've, I've heard, and, and I'm sure that you, you know, you don't want to, uh, to say too much, but I, I get the feeling that Vince McMahon wasn't a safe, you know, Vince McMahon was not that safe back in the day. I, I think, I think he was a, a, a hated person and some of these, some of these territories, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I don't imagine. think he was well like yeah, a lot of guys were pretty hot because, you know, yeah. they'd all worked hard, you know, building these territories from scratch. And when Vern first came in here, they were drawing 400 people at the arena. This is in 1960. And then he was responsible for developing that whole TV network. Yeah. Winnipeg, Milwaukee, Green Bay, Chicago, all of Wisconsin, all of North and South Dakota. Winnipeg, Chicago, Illinois, all of Illinois. We have had most of them there. Uh, Nebraska, Colorado. Then we went into Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Las Vegas, San Francisco, and Oakland. And then we, we wrestled in you know Montreal and on special occasions in Toronto, in Vancouver. I mean, nobody else had that that size yeah. of territory. Plus, we had fantastic talent. We only had probably at tops eighteen guys on board, maybe sixteen, and they all made money. I mean, they were making really good money, and that they could make this. Nick Bachwinkle, I didn't know this till just recently, was offered, you know, coming uh, the be the NWA champion. And okay. Nick sat there, and this is the story I heard uh, from somebody very close to him. He, he thought, he said, now, let's see. If I go to the NWA, and I'm working now 365 days out of the year, and I know what they're making, and I'm working 270 days or 250 days here, being able to see my wife, and I'm making just as much as I'm going to make in 365 days. It doesn't make any sense. It's math. <laughs> so he's he nick hung in there with us you know he was he was he was very very good ray stevens was fantastic yeah. wahoo mcdaniels came in i mean you know we had we had great talent a, f a friend of mine uh brian hardy uh he's uh he's 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 one of the hardy boys one of not not one of the hardys uh no oh, not, not, not that hardy one. Uh, okay. he is, he is, a he's, he's got a long history of indie wrestling. He did, he did some WWE TV work. Uh, his dad is a guy named Barry Hardy, who was a, a very, uh, he was a WWF TV worker for a long, long time. Anyway, he helped me get connected with you. And he wanted me to ask you a question. He wanted me to ask you, why was Greg Gagne never the AWA champion? Couldn't beat Nick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Couldn't get out of the sleeper. No, uh, there was. No, it was, uh, you know, I, I really, I would have liked to have been. Nick Bachwinkle said one time, if I was like 220, 225, he said, you'd be the best baby face champion of all time. And that came from Nick. That's not me. You know, I don't like talking about myself, but um, I was smaller than the other guys. Uh, our promoter in Milwaukee wanted me to be the champion so bad and sort of a Denver promoter. Uh, but, and I was fine with the tag team championships. You know, if you w win the title, you say, well, it's Fern's kid. That's why they get, that's why he's got the title. You know, I, Can't I tried to put that completely out of my mind. I just wanted to be me and do my thing. And I was very successful with Jim, Jim Brunzel. I was uh, successful as single um, TV champion. We just didn't have the talent to work with. Sure. Uh, but it was, you know, no regrets. Well, you know, I want to I want to give uh, Power Town and, and your your adventures and wrestling figures some some time. 
Um, but I have here, I have, I have this, uh, this, if you don't recognize. I don't even have one of those. Well, this is, this is, this is you. And there's, yeah. if I could reach it. I see a nothing. bunch of them back there. There are a bunch of them. Yeah. But what I wanted to, you know, the face, you know, now that you're in the wrestling business, the wrestling figure business, you know, about head scans and things like that. This is a very nice, very nice looking head of Greg Gagne. But as we go down here a little further. We've got we've got some stuff here. If you if you want to take a look, if I can get this off, yeah, uh, I was putting the weights then. You, then I, I never got on the steroids though. <laughs> yeah. Who who's was this your idea to put to to give you this beautiful? No, no, that's <laughs> no. What what do you know that? Of you course, know, of course. Steve course. Rosenthal, you know, he of was course. with Remco Toys, and when they did it, they only they only do three but three different bodies, right? And you know, they do the one with the the abs and then they make one with a little different look and then they get the heavier guys. Yes. And then we put the heads on those bodies. So yes. you know, luckily I got that one. You got this one. Yeah. You, this, this yeah. is uh that's about a 12 pack there in the belly. That's very nice. Oh, so how you. did, so now you're back, you're back in, you're now back, we're back. Well, you're back well, in the toy business. How did this happen? Uh, well, I got a call from Steve Rosenthal about nine months ago. He said, how would you like to get in the toy business? I said, I don't know. I don't know anything about the toy business. He says, well, I do. <laughs> and he said, I was playing golf with four individuals that used to be president CEOs of, of, um, of uh, toy companies. And they said, wrestling is really hot. Yeah. So I got a couple of other guys that I know really well. And they did 14 hours on the phone with collectors from around the world. And you know what they wanted to see? The old stuff. So what we've done, I said, Steve, let me run this by you. Let's start in the 50s. 1950, when TV wrestling started on the Dumont Network out of Chicago, it ran from 50 to 57. You got Luthez, Vern Gagne, Dick the Bruiser, Yukon Eric, Hard Boiled Haggerty, uh, Mighty Atlas, Angelo Pafo, yes. Wilbur Snyder, the Crusher, Hans Schmidt. Mm. You got you got these great names that never had. They had national exposure, but they've never had an action figure. And they hit the the historians with that. Bam! That's what we want. So we started in 1950 and go up to 19 about 1990s. We've got men talent, we got ladies talent, and we've got the little people. The midgets. Nobody's ever done those. You know what excited me the most about this line was as a as a as a collector of of figures as an adult, but also as a kid. I would. I mean, this was the only toy I played with. You didn't have somebody that the big guy could beat. You didn't have somebody that the superstar could beat. And in this line, we're going to get some of the guys. Uh, I've heard names like George South. Um, you know. Uh, Maybe Jake the Milkman, I'm, I'm hearing. Jake the Milkman, uh, Johnny Rods. We, we took the guys from those areas that never, they never had a chance. And those are the guys that made us the champions. You know, we really did. And um, we, got our, we got about eight from the AWA. We've got some uh, from the NWA. We got guys from New York. The guys that were on TV but never won. Right. Uh, you know, they were called... They give them the name, the jobbers. We didn't yeah. ever call them that, but other people did. Sure. They were so important to our industry and they never got a break. They didn't have either the look or they didn't have the, you know, the ability because most of them weren't tra trained properly um, and just didn't get over with the public. So we are bringing them all. To the all right, guys. So unfortunately, at around the 45 minute mark, the Zoom connection cut off, and um, I couldn't tell you how disappointed I was. Uh, but that was pretty much the end of the interview. Uh, Greg Gagne goes on basically to mention that, uh, and I'm not sure if it got included in this clip, but uh, mo the uh, in addition to superstar names in the Power Town line, uh, they're hoping to have undercard talent as well. Uh, enhancement workers, if you will, jobbers to some people. Uh, but there's some pretty good names that are included in that batch. 
of enhancement workers. Uh, Jake Milliman, Jake the Milkman Milliman from the AWA, uh, George South from the NWA, Johnny Rods from pretty much everywhere. Uh, are, are signed on t to this project, so it should be great. Uh, you didn't miss anything else. Um, I, I was, I, I was going to wrap it up pretty much at the uh, at the you know 50 minute mark. So uh, that's the bulk of the interview. You saw the whole thing. So thanks to Greg Gagne, who's probably not watching this. Thanks to Magnum Da, uh, who's also not watching this. Steve Rosenthal and uh, my man TK from the uh, from the Remco groups. I got to do some fun stuff, talk to these guys. So that's all. Hope you enjoyed. Good night now.